Good morning. Uh, what a privilege it is to be with you and to be part of this Thornwell lecture series and how grateful I am to be with you in this unusual way and in this unusual time. Uh, Barbara and I uh, feel blessed to be part of the fellowship at First Presbyterian Church. We frequently visit and worship here on those Sundays when I am not out preaching somewhere else. And I have been assigned a topic for these series of lectures. My topic is, what is Jesus doing today in the church? And we must begin with scripture. And there are many places where I could turn to begin reading scripture, but here is where we will go for this day. It's in Matthew chapter 16 and verses 13 through 19, verses that no doubt will be familiar to many of you. But listen carefully, for this is the word of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Greek word for church that is used in this passage is the word ekklesia. It is a compound of two Greek words that have made their way into our modern English language. The first one is the word ek, which means out. We find it on signs and buildings uh, the word exit comes from that Greek word ek. The other word is klesia, the other half of the word. It's actually from the Greek root kaleo, uh, meaning to call. The word call that we have in English comes from that Greek word kaleo. And so the church is those who are called out. They're called out of where they were to a new way of life. So to be a Christian is to be called out. You and I do not have a job as Christians. We have a call as Christians. And Matthew 16 goes much deeper than some people think. There are some people who say, well, this is where the church begins in Matthew chapter 16. But the fact is that you can trace the roots of the church much farther back than this, all through the Old Testament, beginning actually in Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, where God calls out Abram from Ur, which is in modern day Iraq. He says, go out from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. And you notice the similarity between uh, these two passages of Genesis 12 and Matthew chapter 16. Here we hear Abram called out, and here we hear him told that uh, whatever you find blessing in, I will bless. Whatever does not bless you, I will curse. And your job is that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what we see here in Matthew 16 is, is not the establishing of the church by Christ, uh, but him declaring it to be unquestionably his own. Or we might say that at this moment in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
He declares the church to be under new management, as we might say, in the business world. From henceforth, it will be known as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has big plans for it. I mean, he has really big plans for it. Christ's intention is to make his church the most relevant, vibrant institution that the world will ever see. And that is what we are. Even the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. It is a truth that more schools, more colleges, more universities, and more hospitals have been established for the betterment and taking care of people by Christ's church than by any other organization or institution in the history of the world. But there's an implication here. And the implication is that the church will have enemies. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It does not say that they will not try. It says that they will not prevail. The church will always have enemies who will plot against it and attempt to do away with it. Why, throughout its history, there have been those who have worked against the church. Even today, we know that. And so that, by itself, however, is an entirely different course of study for another time. But today, the church has a particular enemy uh, in fear and anxiety at work against the church. Let's face it, uh, that is exactly why we are meeting through this media rather than in person. Today we see many instances of fear building on fear, and it's nothing new. The human race seethes with unrest and rebellion. Look around America and you discover that our political institutions make a mockery of that united in the United States of America. We bar and we deadbolt our homes against the threat of robbery or worse. And the recent riots across our country and many of our cities uh, have demonstrated again that there is really a very thin line between anarchy and civilized society, and maybe some people don't quite understand it. There's nothing new about these attacks on humanity or even on the church. But the question becomes immediately, how will we respond to these attacks? Can the church really make a difference in a wobbly world such as ours? Well, amazingly, that is what Paul the Apostle writes about in his letter to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. Those first century Christians faced circumstances not very far removed from the ones that we do. Uh, they, They lived in a morally corrupt atmosphere, not unlike ours. And Paul tells them how to respond. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4 and the first three verses. You see, Paul recognizes that against the anguish and the uncertainty of times like ours, the church has an unmatched offer of comfort and hope and peace for its own people and for the whole world. Elsewhere, he will write to the Philippians, be anxious for nothing. Paul writes these words in chains from a squalid underground, lice-ridden, roach-infested Roman prison cell. And he anticipates the real possibility that death, a cruel death, is really just ahead. I have stood on the edge of that cell that Paul occupied, and I've peered down into it. And I can tell you that even from that position, you would look in there and you would realize that anyone in that cell has a very good reason to be afraid. 
But now here, he who once set his face against the church of Christ has become its greatest advocate in his lifetime. And he says, do not be anxious about anything. And we, we say, but Paul, wait a minute. Uh, you have been beaten with a cat of nine tails. And he says, that's true, but I'm not anxious. But Paul, your, your body is ripped open with gaping wounds for, for all kinds of infestation from the creepy, crawly vermin that live around you in that dark hole where you're chained to the wall. He says, yes, but I'm not worried. Uh, but Paul, Paul, your food is dreadful. It's unclean and it's barely fit for human consumption and absolutely not sufficient to sustain human life. And Paul might say, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. It's awful as a matter of fact. But I'm not concerned about that. I'm not worried about that. You see, Paul has taken into himself the, uh, the spiritual DNA of the two most uttered words that fell from the lips of the Lord Jesus. And they are the foundation that tell us how we must respond to times like these. Fear not, Jesus says. Fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. In this coronavirus age, uh, we reason not to fear and anxiety, uh, but against them. For we are the church. We are the church of which Paul had become a part by being adopted into it, just as you and I have done. And God, through Jesus and Paul, places on the other side of our life scales a word not of fear, but a word of hope. The Oxford mathematician and Christian apologist, a, a scholar of triple doctorates, and another son of Belfast, the city of my birth, Dr. John Lennox, in his book on the coronavirus says, in times of crisis, hope is what we look for. He's right. He's right. And we remember that ours is not a hope that is based on some positive psychology or wishful thinking, uh, an elusive antibodies or a possible future vaccination not yet realized, but upon our faith on the Calvary cross death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the church. And we are the people of hope in every circumstance because we have an everlasting gospel. I want to get back to those two words in just a little bit. We have a word for all time and for any circumstance. In a recent uh, New York Times article, the Italian journalist Mattia Farasisi writes, holy water is not a hand sanitizer and, and prayer is not a vaccine, but for believers, Religion is a fundamental source of healing and hope. It is a remedy against despair, providing psychological and emotional support that is an integral part of well-being. It's also an antidote to loneliness, which several medical experts point out to as one of the most worrisome public issues of our time. Well, she's right too. If we ever needed the church, if our society ever needed the church, we surely need it now, around our world, in a way never before experienced in our time. Millions are in the grip of fear and tragedy. With global deaths in the hundreds of thousands, the coronavirus pandemic has swept away every continent with crippling health and uh, destroying lives uh, endangering the economies of the nations and leaving many, many families with unemployment. But against that, we are the church, and we shall not be anxious, for Christ has died and risen again, and he has given us a word of unequal hope in the eternal gospel. But let me tell you what fires me up. Uh, this virus has swept the church to a place never before experienced in her history. 
It is brought into our everyday language, a 17th century word that I suspect some of us did not even know about six months ago. Pandemic. Pandemics actually happen with some degree of regularity in my own lifetime, uh, roughly since the end of the Second World War. There have been at least eight global pandemics and they've killed millions of people. And we've heard in these circumstances of the great global flu epidemic or pandemic of 1918, with a worldwide death toll of some 20 to 50 million people. And farther back in history, uh, there was the pandemic of the Black Plague from about 1346 to 1353, with an estimated worldwide death toll of about 75 to 200 million people. And before that, uh, the famous bubonic plague pandemic of 541, 542 AD, where history records a death toll exceeding 25 million people. <clears throat> but in no previous great plagues or pandemics did the church cease to meet. Although many of these pandemics took a far greater toll on the world's human population than the coronavirus, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ continued to meet and to worship and to study and to work together. Indeed, often more so. They would meet for prayer and pray all night long against these pandemics. But something has happened this time with this COVID-19 pandemic that frankly I find troubling and challenging and I hope that you do too. And that is this time the church has stopped meeting. In all of church history that has never happened even once before. If as we say in our ordination buzz scripture is the only infallible rule of faith and practice, then I must say that I see nowhere in Scripture that gives the church permission to stop meeting. Indeed, in our inerrant Bible, we read these words, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I'm talking from Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 23 through 25. You see, uh, something happens when God's people come together. Something happens when God's people meet in the church and in God's house. In a word, the church has a power against any such thing. Now, let me assure you that it is very hard for me to come here and say these things, and I'm not saying them very well. I know that. And I'm glad to be here, even in this format. But this is a word that God has laid firmly on my heart for this season. And it's a heavy, heavy burden for me. Hear it again. He says, we are to meet to stir one another up to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. You see... If Scripture is indeed the only infallible rule of faith and practice, there are no loopholes there that I can see, and I see no exceptions. Because, as I said, something happens, something very wonderful, some might even say something mystical happens. When God's people come together, something that cannot take place in any other way or in any other place. Dr. Thomas says this well as he shares from his heart 
in our recent First Things column written to this congregation. He writes, It has been a long and difficult season. What have I missed most of all in this strange season? Worship with actual people present, of course. But it's more than that. It's the people I miss. We were made for fellowship. As image bearers of God, we were created and recreated for fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. Younger folk tend not to use that word fellowship, and they employ community instead. But in the New Testament, koinonia, translated fellowship, or perhaps even community, uh, there is a signification uh, that we have a share in something, something for sharing with someone, or, or you could say participation in something or with someone. And of course, we can do that to some extent virtually, Dr. Thomas says, but it is not the same. We were meant to share things together, a meal, a conversation, a word of encouragement, or a prayer. He is right. He is right. And that is what makes this time so different and so difficult for so many of us. Uh, we need one another. He says we were made for fellowship. As image bearer of God, we were created and recreated for fellowship with God and fellowship with each other, to share things, a meal, a conversation, a word of encouragement or a prayer. Uh, this word fellowship is a fascinating word. It, it is a, a byproduct of each of the three primary things that I, I want to say to you in just a moment. Uh, I find it a fascinating word. It is interesting uh, that the Bible never explicitly commands the church to fellowship. And yet, 59 times in the New Testament, the Bible speaks about one another. We call them the one another texts. And so uh, this togetherness, this fellowship with each other, this byproduct, if you will, must be something that is very important to God. And as Dr. Thomas notes well, also to us, today our world truly needs uh, these church one anotherisms. Now I know, don't write to me and tell me there's no such word as a one anotherism. I, I just coined that word because I think you understand what I'm trying to say. There is no better place than the church for such a time as this time we live in. And so I am very, very glad, and I suspect many of you are glad, that our First Presbyterian Church elders are exercising their authority to resume our church worship meetings. And I want to compliment them, even as I compliment our pastors and the church staff for uh, their good use of podcast and live stream and other electronic media uh, through which uh, they have brought us uh, weekly sermons, daily devotionals, uh, prayer meetings, uh, special music and the pastor's round table and other events. If you've got access to the internet or a telephone, you, you have had the feeling that you were never far away from pastoral care here at First Presbyterian Church. And I know of no team of pastors who have worked harder to stay in touch with their people than the pastoral team and the staff at First Presbyterian Church. And what they have been doing is part of what Christ is doing in his church today. So thank you elders, thank you pastors, thank you staff at First Presbyterian Church for what you've been doing. Christ is working through you. What else is Christ doing in his church today? Well, that is the question of the hour, isn't it? And, and I must get after it 
And I begin by saying this, though, uh, that Jesus has no backup plan. There is no plan B. We are the church, and we are his one and only plan for this life and for the life to come. Moreover, he is active in the here and now in the church. Our Lord is not off in some remote corner of heaven viewing the world through some kind of celestial telescope. He has not left us here to, to struggle and flounder against whatever the world hands to us. To the contrary, he is alive. And, and just as he said, he is with us always, even to the end of the age. And there's not a day, not an hour, not even so much as a minute or a nanosecond in which he is not a part of the church and working in it. And whatever he does in the church, he does most often through us. And I believe that the challenge of this pandemic and our response to it in many places is giving Satan a laughing heyday. Moreover, uh, rather than fear that this COVID-19 pandemic and what it's doing to us, we have set a very dangerous precedent, in my opinion, by allowing some people who are not a part of the body of Christ, some who would not profess to be Christians, to tell us when and how and where we can worship. Dear friends, make no mistake, the world watches the church. And the question is, are we as Christians living up to our mandate in their eyes? Is the challenge of this time that we should demonstrate to the world that we are a people worthy of trusting with Christ's word, with this everlasting message of present truth that our world so desperately needs? And furthermore, that we are reliable in carrying out what has been assigned to us. When we live out this message as the church, surely our joy will be to hear said of us what was said of Esther. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther 4, 14. This is our such a time moment. Our moment of unprecedented opportunity to be the church of Jesus Christ. And through this pandemic with its accompanying lockdown and curfews and isolations and quarantines, we are challenged uh, to, to look again at what the psalmist says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know those words, they come from everybody's favorite psalm, Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Death, David says, influenced by the Holy Spirit. But then he says something more, and it takes a, a stiff faith to finish his sentence. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You see, David, the psalmist, knows, I suspect, that in the end there is one enemy that will never be driven off, and that enemy is death. We will all die if our Lord does not return in our lifetime. But here too, Jesus uses his church to protect. He protects us from unbelief. And through his earthly kingdom, the church, he preserves us for his heavenly kingdom. Am I saying that the coronavirus is not a danger to Christians? That it cannot attack us? Of course not, although I, I do find it interesting as moderator of the ARP Church uh, that I have not yet heard about the coronavirus in one of our numerous congregations that have continued to worship all through this time. Make no mistake about it, dear friends. Uh, unless the Lord comes first, we will all die of something. You will. So will I. 
It could be the coronavirus, or it could be something else. In another year or so, I will have been a pastor for 50 years. And I've lived a life that no one could ever deserve to live. What a blessing it has been. But it has not been without sadness. My first funeral as a, a young pastor, not even yet ordained, was of a 25-year-old woman who died with a very aggressive form of cancer. And she left three little children. She was diagnosed and she died all in the same month. Uh, my, my second funeral in that same church was for a 17-year-old who was run over minutes after I had been with him by one of his best friends and killed. And if through my pastoral ministry I have learned nothing else, I have learned this. Sickness can overcome the healthiest looking believer. And death can call the most promising among us at any moment. Yet, says David, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Uh, so we must not fear. I have stood at too many gravesides of, of too many loved ones to think anything different than that. Faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ allows us to say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And if that is not true, then I have nothing to tell you today. I have no hope to offer you today, and I am left bankrupt of hope within myself. But these almost 50 years of pastoral ministry have taught me this, that it is a wonderful thing to be a Christian, to be part of the church that is called by Christ, and to stand as a part of this world's only anchor of stability and hope, even in the face of death. For we stand on the everlasting gospel, calling the world to witness that we trust Jesus. So what is Jesus saying to his church today? Again, I, I think of the messages of the three angels in Revelation chapter 14 at verses 6 through 12. They speak to us, for here's what John writes under the influence of the Spirit. And then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the call for endurance of the saints, those who have kept the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. That last phrase is strictly about the church. And this, dear friends, is what the world needs to hear in this COVID-19 age. It's what Christ has gifted us in the church to pass on for such a time as this. Uh, the, the eternal gospel, John calls it. And he uses another great Greek word, Ionian. It's a word that has just seven letters in the Greek, and if I transliterate it into English, it has seven letters again. But my, what a word. It's translated throughout the scriptures as eternal or everlasting. 
But get this, church. Uh, don't, don't limit your thinking of everlasting or eternal by thinking only in terms of length. Ionian is not just about length. It is also about depth. And so I encapsulate finally the message of what Jesus is doing in his church in three short phrases that I'm about to give you. And he is doing exactly what he was doing on that very day when he spoke those words to Peter. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So why does Christ have a church? I submit that when we look at Scripture, we discover that indeed the Scriptures speak of the church under three main headings. First of all, in the church, he is calling us to exalt the Lord and worship. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them, he says in Matthew 18 and in other places. Then he says, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself in John 12, 32. You see, he is the Lord for always. That's the length part of Ionian. But he is the Lord for all events. That's the depth part of Ionian. He's with us and in all seasons, uh, but uniquely so when we gather together for worship. What have I missed most of all in this strange season? Dr. Thomas asks, then he answers, worship with actual people present, of course. Ah, the psalmist says in Psalm 50, verse 5, Gather to me my people, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And in the New Testament, we read this repeated phrase on the first day of the week when we were gathered together. Paul testifies, I rejoice with you that we are worshiping again at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia. May we employ our collective sanctified imagination and think of the magnificent facilities that God has made available to us here in this corner and step up to the challenge of allowing the whole church to come together, maybe even in different locations around our buildings very soon now. Why? Why? Because worship is the heartbeat of the church. If you want to know what a particular church is really like, there is no better way to find out than to step in and to worship at that church. Vance Hafner used to say, most Sunday services start at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 12 o'clock dull. Well, that's certainly not the case when you worship at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia. And what is more, uh, there is nothing in this life that we shall take to heaven where Jesus sits at the right hand of power except our understanding of worship. Revelation 5.13 tells us that we shall worship the Lamb forever and forever. And our doctrine finds its expression in our corporate worship as nowhere else. Our gathered praise, listening to God's Word preached, shapes our theology. Every time the preacher stands up in the pulpit and opens his mouth, Christ speaks through him. Christ chooses him and chooses every text and formulates every sermon that you will hear from the pulpit. Martin Luther understood this very well. In his congregation in Wittenberg in the 1520s, the preachers preached, but not only did they preach, they also led the hymn singing. If you can imagine, uh, the, the preacher would begin the first phrase of a song from the pulpit, and then the congregation would join in. And this practice wonderfully symbolizes how the word of Christ takes root in our very soul. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In our corporate church gatherings, Christ calls us both to spiritual worship and spiritual warfare through singing. Another time, Luther testifies, music is a fair and lovely gift of God which has often wakened and moved me to the joy of preaching. Music drives away the devil and makes the people happy. Next, after theology, I give to music the highest praise and the greatest honor. We know 
that to the devils music is unsufferable. Luther understood that not only do God's people learn theological doctrine and singing, nothing scares off the devil like singing, but in music we are given the gospel in a way that makes it easy to remember. And boy, can I testify to the deep spiritual experience of this. Once upon a time, in the darkest point of my ministry, I was saved from making a bad situation worse through listening to and singing with the people of God recorded on old-fashioned cassette tapes. Why, how many days? How many days did I plod across old Kennesaw Mountain, across those sods where many a soldier gave his life? And God, through those recorded hymns of the church and the recorded preaching of the word, gave me renewed life. I can testify to that. He picked me up out of the pit of destruction and out of the Mary bog. He set my feet on a rock and made my step secure. He put a new song in my mouth, as the psalmist says, a song of praise to our God. I know, oh, how I know, for on that mountain, God met me and God gave me a new song. Guide me, O oh, thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me now and evermore. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee, I will ever give to thee. I know, I know, I've already quoted uh, two Irish fellows in this reading this morning, but lest you think I'm prejudiced, that great hymn was given to us by William Williams, a Welshman, and it's the church's hymn given through Williams by Christ for us to sing. And I know what God can do through worship, even recorded worship, for he did it for me. So sing we must, sing we should. God is a spirit and those who worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. What is Jesus doing in his church today? He who is with us always, what is he doing in worship? I'll tell you what, he is listening in. He is teaching us as we worship together and preaching and singing, and he is picking up one of his downtrodden children. I know, for I have been that one. We exalt the Lord in worship. Second, and I said there are three things. He is calling us to equip the laity for work. It says he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastor teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Dr. Al Mohler, in his new book, The Gathering Storm, I know the titles have been used before. He admits that on, on the first page that he got that title from Winston Churchill. But he says, society has progressed to the point where religious organizations, churches, and even individual Christians should no longer enjoy religious freedom. Well, I'm a big fan of Dr. Moeller, but that's not a good word choice there, sir. That's not progress. That's regress. And against such an age as this, the church has teaching opportunities. Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is in the church as our theological educator par excellence. He is in the church because in the church he will pick out those whom he has called to be new leaders. I, I stand in this room recording this today with two seminarians 
right beside me. And there is, to paraphrase Dr. D.A. Carson, a straight line between the Great Commission and our personal commission. Jesus uses the church to keep us straight and to work us out in our theology. When Paul speaks of the church as the body of Christ, he is making sure that we understand that. And now at this word, I, I must speak another word of clarification, I suppose. Uh, when, I, uh, when I say that uh, God is working in the church to teach us, I am not saying that going to church gets you saved. Of course not. That would be the very sacerdotalism from which the Reformation saved us. But there are those who attend the church who are not believers, and yet I can think of no better place for them to be than among the people of God. And that's what makes worship so important. In the church, God calls us. Then finally, in the church, he calls us to evangelize the lost through our witness. Listen again to the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I want you to notice something. It's another point of clarification. We're not called in the church to make converts. We're called to make disciples. The Greek word is the word mathetusete. It comes from mathetes. It's a word that is borrowed in the Greek directly from the lectionary of a horse trainer. And it means saddle broken. What's a saddle broken horse? Well, it's a horse that heeds its master's voice. And Jesus is working in his church today, calling us not just to make converts, but converts who will be discipled, who will become disciples and will do what the master says and heed his commands. And the world outside the church needs to hear that. But we need to see it and heed it and hear it for ourselves. I think as I close that there are at least three things that this pandemic has given us for fulfilling the Great Commission in the church. First of all, it has given us an urgent incentive to become more innovative in regard to social media and technology. Secondly, it has demonstrated again the importance of involving younger disciples in our outreach programs. I will be the first to admit that they understand more about the incredible availability of social media and technology today and with their collective imaginations, they can come up with ideas that, that have never entered my mind. And then third, this coronavirus has inadvertently renewed the urgency of the message of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as the world's most relevant and needed message. Coronavirus. What a name. Did you know that it is so named because it reminded its discoverers of a crown. Corona, you see, is the Latin word for crown. And where I grew up, a crown is a symbol of authority and power. And the seed for this thought was given by something I read from Dr. Lennox, whom I quoted earlier. We live in a battle, my friends, between two crowns today. Choose well the crown that will lead you. One is a virus. It comes and it goes like all the other viruses. Most likely it will be conquered. But the only other crown worth following is the crown that will never be conquered. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It will never be overthrown. Even the gates of hell cannot throw it over. And that crown sits on the head that once wore a crown of thorns, the one who called it my church, the one of whom Paul writes one day, every knee shall bow before him in heaven and on earth. One crown deserves our allegiance. One crown deserves our loyalty. 
Thomas Kelly, a son of a Dublin judge. Decided to follow his father into the law. He went and studied the law. He decided as he finished and was admitted to the bar that one day he would aim to be a judge to take his father's place. But then, lo and behold, he went to church and he was saved by Christ there. It was a glorious conversion experience of a young man who was on the wrong track of life. And he could from that moment forward no more stay quiet than a bird can stop singing. And he surrendered to preaching the gospel. And he wrote hymns. And one of those hymns was this one. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. That is the message of the church. That's what Christ is doing today. This earthly church that our Lord created and has created is designed always to live just one generation away from extinction. The great pandemics of the past could not kill it, and the coronavirus will not either. Heretics and their heresies cannot kill it, but we can. We can kill it by our failure to pass on that eternal gospel to a new generation. Without our intentional evangelism, the church will be as dead as a dodo bird one generation from now. Let a, none of us expect other church members, elders, deacons, interns, pastors, Christian educators, music people, administrators, to be more intentional or more urgent about carrying out the message to lost people than we are ourselves. Don't expect others to do it. You do it. That's what Christ is saying to his church. Will you pray with me? Father, take these words from lips of clay and let them move your people in a powerful way by your Holy Spirit that we may rise up as church of God, have done with lesser things, give heart and hands and soul and voice to serve your Son the King of Kings. We ask in His name and for His sake. Amen.